The new Apple Watch reviews are in, and they are eh. The DEA forgot that mass surveillance was, in fact, illegal. And the Brontosaurus is back and better than ever. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 312 for Wednesday, April 8th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Let's get right to today's big news. Apple released iOS 8.3 today with a few new features and fixes, including diverse emojis and bacon emojis. And you might have also heard that they lifted the embargo on Apple Watch reviews, so every journalist who already has theirs is free to publicly fawn over or criticize their newest wrist adornment. Here to discuss this, the recent reviews, and to cover a few other tech stories, is the ever-amusing Ian Thompson from The Register. <laughs> Welcome, Ian. Well, well, thank you, Megan. That's a very nice introduction. <laughs> well, so the reading, my reading of the reviews taken as a whole was that the Apple Watch was pretty ga- great for, like, really geeky people, but for regular people it was just eh. But you had a different view on, on reading all those reviews, huh? Well, I just found it surprising. The way Apple works is that they'll give a certain select cadre of journalists, you know, the hardware in advance so they can check it out. And the rule of that is, if you offer any serious criticism of Apple, then you're not invited back next time. So usually it's fawning reviews. But as you say, a lot of these reviews weren't exactly the usual sort of knee pad equipped, you know, Apple fe- Apple festivals of love that they usually are. There were some, a few moderate and some quite serious criticisms of it in that, you know, they still haven't sorted out the battery life and it is kind of geeky and it's very expensive. I mean, if 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 the journalists who are relying on this kind of thing can't polish the turd enough, then I'm sorry, it it doesn't look particularly good for Apple's standpoint. Yeah, I mean, it it is interesting because, I mean, a lot of the criticisms were just like, it's fine, you don't really need one yet, which I think is kind of true about every new Apple product, Um, you know, (laughs) but I think this one, they're pushing a little bit harder, I guess. Well, yes, I mean, it's always going to be an ancillary product for Apple because you've got to have an iPhone to actually use it. And that's always been the big failing of smartwatches is that in order to actually get anything, anything useful out of them, you've got to have a phone attached. Um, the price is putting some people off. The one thing I didn't see people mentioning was Apple's wireless charging standard, which goes against the rest of the industry. Uh, but um, that's a relatively minor point. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a very expensive watch, which you've got to recharge every 24 hours, which isn't going to appeal to that many people, I don't think, in the long run. You'll see a big spike in sales in the first three to six months when the, you know, the Apple fanboys and girls pile in, because let's face it, Tim Cook, um, you know, took a... A uh, piece of dog waste out the gutter and put an Apple logo on it. They would probably buy it for a decent. You know, there's a certain kind of person that would buy it anyway. Right. True. Well, Farhad Menju from the New York Times said that it took him three days, but that finally he did fall hard for the Apple Watch. And he points to a feature that I'm really looking forward to, um, and that's feeling less tethered to your smartphone. Which, admittedly, I could do on my own without a watch by just putting my smartphone away. But I don't know. Is that something that would interest you? Just the idea that you wouldn't have to be checking your phone so often. Well, yes and no. I mean, it is it is quite a handy little feature, but there's a huge downside. It's very rude if you're you know in the middle of a meeting or having dinner to check your phones. This is you know why we insist everyone puts their phones away at the start of dinner. But if you've got a smartwatch which is buzzing you and sending you little messages, when I was testing these things out, I found whenever it buzzed, the urge was to look at your watch. Now, that is also incredibly rude. And I mean, particularly if you're having an in-depth discussion with someone and you look at your watch, you're basically saying, yeah, what's on my wrist is more important from what you're saying at the moment, so please shut up for a second. So, I mean, yeah, having those kind of wrist activation, wrist, wrist notifications, it's good, but it's still a little bit rude, I can't help feeling. 
Right. Well, I mean, looking at your watch, you make a good point, is actually even ruder because it's like, well, I don't really have time for you. You know? <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. It's uh, we had a famous case in the Australian Parliament last year when um, the two leaders of the the two leaders of the relative party were lambasting each other and, the, and one of them looked at his watch and it's just and his opponent just lost it and went, the honourable member is looking at his watch. Might I remind him this is considered rude in some circumstances? So, yes, it is a social faux pas. But, you know, that's what technology is about in a lot of ways. That's true. And the Washington Post headline was interesting. It said, should you buy an Apple Watch? And I mean, no one should buy an Apple Watch. I mean, you shouldn't eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's every day. I mean, you could if you want to go for it. But I mean, it was interesting that they use the word should because I mean, mm. it's not a should issue, really, I think. Well, any headline that ends in a, in a question mark, the answer is usually no. But um, yeah, I mean, People will buy it. Initially, I think a lot of people are going to buy it in an immediate surge. Um, whether or not long term, it's something that Apple is going to is going to keep in, keep on. It depends on how the technology develops. Key to that is battery life, but there's also processor power as well and screen technology. As the technology matures, I can see smartwatches being really quite handy. But the key thing is battery life and getting a SIM card in there so that you don't have to carry a smartphone around all the time as well. Right. I mean, a lot of people keep saying, just wait for the next version. I mean, I was talking to my dad. He's 72. He says, I'm going to get this one because he doesn't have that much longer to wait. <laughs> he doesn't have the time. He's got to get one now. So, I mean, maybe there's a lot of people out there like that. They, they well, just can't I wait. I, li I mean, I like his attitude. But if you're, I mean, looking at the really high-end version, any wanker who spends $18,000 on a watch which is going to be outdated in two years is just an utter plonker. And if you see that on someone's wrist, you just know this person has more money than sense. Right. Well, I don't think my dad was going to buy that version. And uh, I need to remind him that my children still need to go to college and I would like to. <laughs> that. Yes, Thanks. very wise. So let's switch gears. A lot of people point to 9-11 as the moment when we all made the Hobson's choice to trade privacy for security and surveillance. But now we're learning that the DEA has been tracking our international phone calls for at least a decade before the September 11th attack. What have they been tracking exactly? Basically, they seem to have been tracking all ingoing and outcoming calls from uh, from non-U.S. citizens and then sticking that all into a massive database. Um, the original argument was, you know, drugs are bad, okay, so uh, we, we should be allowed to do this. And George Bush the first actually signed off on this and said, yep, that's fine, you should be doing this. Now, they, it hasn't been revealed how widely the DEA shared this, this data, but as we've already seen with the Snowden leaks, the DEA and the NSA worked together very closely to share information. So it's certainly not unreasonable to suspect that this kind of information was shared with all the other intelligence agencies, which just goes to show quite how limited this level of mass surveillance is because you get so much information in and yet they still can't stop the, the, the largest terrorist attack on U.S. soil. Right, and they have not done anything about the drug problem through this either, I don't think. <laughs> Drugs have never been cheaper nor more available or, or, more, or, more, or, 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 sort of, or more powerful than they are now. Right. So, yes, I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of money tied up in the drug war, so it's going to carry on for some time. But the fact that our privacy is now, has, has now been revealed to have been completely out the window in the drug war as well should maybe make, make people think about this because, you know, I mean, they've been collecting this stuff since, what, 92, 93? Doesn't seem to, you know, I don't see any drug dealers, you know, having major problems with this. Drugs are still perfectly available and cheap. So this, as I say, it's just another nail in the coffin of this myth that mass surveillance keeps us all safe. Right. So you reported this back in January, but there was news today. What was the news today that came out? Uh, basically, the EFF, uh, on behalf of Human Rights Watch, is suing the DEA over this. So, with any kind of luck, if the le if the law case uh, legal case goes ahead, we're going to be getting a lot more details, uh, both on what exactly was was uh, was purloined or harvested, as they would like, like prefer to say, what use it was put to, which is going to be absolutely critical, uh, and also the, the the method by which they convince politicians to give them this power. I mean. <sighs> We've already seen with uh, the mass surveillance system reports into mass surveillance that the NSA has been running post 9-11, that in fact they've only managed to get one terrorist plot purely on this on this kind of mass surveillance, and that was a taxi driver giving a few thousand dollars to a terrorist organization. Now, if they've been if they've been collecting this information since 1992, so over 20 years, it a court case could open up quite, you know, give us good baseline of how much data they've actually, how much they've been able to use this data to get actual arrests. And if it isn't very much, then I suspect the DEA is going to have some tough questions to answer. Well, it's, it'll be interesting to see that. And 
Your next story is about the brontosaurus. He's back. He's not back yes. exactly. They're, they're not roaming the earth anymore. But you have a story uh, in today's register about scientists say that the brontosaurus was a real dinosaur, not just an ad adolescent apatosaurus, as some scientists have been trying to tell us for the last 100 years. So w and what did they uncover? Well, they've been trying to tell us this and failing us because everyone loves the name Brontosaurus. It's so marvelously evocative, the thunder lizard. You know, it's been used throughout. Yeah, the US, the US Postal Service put Brontosaurus on a stamp in the 1970s, which drove some paleontologist absolutely nuts. But uh, basically, the Brontosaurus was identified by uh, a paleontologist in the 1870s. And then 20 years, a little over 20 years later, it was decided that there was no such thing. And it was, in fact, a juvenile Aptosaurus. Now, the key difference between the two is the Aptosaurus has three bones at its t uh, where the tail joins the spine, and the Brontosaurus has five. But the theory was the Brontosaurus they'd found was a teenager, and those, uh, those five bones would fuse into three later on in life. So anyway, a bunch of London and Portuguese scientists ran a complete statistical analysis on every single Bron uh, Brontosaurus, Apatosaurus, and uh, various other gen uh, similar genii. Uh, and discovered, that, yes, the Brontosaurus almost certainly was its own specific genus, and we can now come back, go back to using that lovely, lovely word. Right. So now, is the Apatosaurus, is that something different, or am I just mispronouncing it? It's the very, Aptosaurus. very similar, yes. Uh, it's Apatosaurus, I think. It's very, very similar. Um, it's got, a, as I say, slightly different tailbone connection. The hips are slightly different, and it had wiser, wider nasal cavities, which would give it a, a slightly boomier uh, sound if it actually, you know, uh, when it was sounding off to its mates or sounding off to say, hang on a second, there's a very large predator approaching us. Um, although that said, with when you're dealing with dinosaurs of this size, then it would have to be a very, very large predator indeed to take them down. Right. Well, um, I did a lot of internet research on this, trying to figure out if the Flintstones dinosaur, not Dino the pet, but the one that uh, Fred would ride around at the quarry, was that the Brontosaurus? I suspect it was simply because the Brontosaurus was the most popular big herbivore of, of, it, of its kind, and it was certainly the right shape. Um, there's lots of things that we don't know about it, which are quite frustrating. It is suspected it had a brain at both ends just to try and coordinate mm. that level. Um, and I feel kind of guilty about the picture we used on the story because there's still a lot of debate about whether or not this went near water or whether it would just sink into a mud hole. So there's so much we don't know. And quite frankly, until we invent a time machine, we're probably not going to know. But it's going to be fun finding out. Right. Well, next time you come on, will you be telling me that Pluto is a planet again? Uh, never going to happen. Okay. I'm sorry. I mean, it's it's a lovely it's a lovely idea, and I did love having Pluto as a planet. But if you're going to have any kind of, of of measurements for planet size in in there, then Pluto just it's a large rock on the out you know, on the outskirts of the Kuiper Belt. It's not really what you call a planet. Sad though that is, and Neil deGrasse Tyson is still getting people giving him about this so, you know, it's just, it's never gonna stop well I'm maybe sure. we'll talk again in a hundred years um when we have apple watches all over our body and then you know maybe it will be story different. our minds in apple watches <laughs> and just holding them up to the screen right <laughs> well ian thompson thank you so much for joining us uh you are a writer at the register do you have any stories coming up that you can tell us about uh we're doing some interesting stuff about a 200 million uh uh Dollar, uh, pound jewelry heist in London, which was uh, apparently uh, one theory is set off by setting off an explosion in internet and power lines. Very Ocean's Eleven stuff, but we shall see. All right. Thank you, Ian. Take care. Thank you very much for having me, Megan. Coming up, we have some Lego stories and some Golden Girls stories and maybe one story about the Legos and the Golden Girls. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. Lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to master Photoshop, develop an app, learn to code to sharpen your HTML skills. Lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. Do you want to sharpen your business skills to ask your boss for a raise or make yourself more marketable to find a new job? I recommend Lynda.com courses like the science of sales, solving common project problems, and the Office 365 essential training series, which covers Excel, Word, Access, PowerPoint, and more. With a lynda.com membership, you can stream thousands of video courses on demand, complete with transcripts, which allow you to follow along or search for an answer and skip to that point in the video. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to visit lynda.com slash TN2 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. 
and we thank them for their support. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Google tried to steal a little Apple Watch thunder with an announcement of their own today. New straps and new faces for your Android watch. Now most Android Wear uses the industry standard 22 millimeter bands, so you already had a choice of a lot of bands. But the official Android blog says there will be a curated collection of bands coming this week. Also, you can now choose from over a thousand new watch faces for your Android Wear. You can select from napping cats, minions, and much, much more. Too bad the battery life is pretty much still the same as the Apple Watch. She hasn't announced that she's running for president in the U.S. yet, but Reuters reports that Hillary Clinton just hired Google exec Stephanie Hannon as her chief technology officer. I will let you form your own joke around the fact that according to her LinkedIn profile, part of Hannon's former role as director of civic innovation and social impact at Google was to change how the world prepares and responds to natural disasters. Now, yesterday I complained about my kids watching ads on YouTube and I implied that I was willing to pay for an ad-free version. Was someone listening? Today, Bloomberg reports that the rumored pay version of YouTube is in the works and could be available this year. YouTube apparently plans to charge $10 a month for the new ad-free service. Things get complicated when you think about the fact that most of what's on YouTube is created not by YouTube, but by someone else. Sometimes, let's say, me. For example, Google sent a set of terms to content creators, and according to the next web, if you don't accept them, your videos will be set to private. And finally, Mashable reporter, reporter Laura Vito made magic happen today for anyone who loves Legos and the Golden Girls. Believe me, that Venn diagram of Lego lovers and B. Arthur fans gets more interesting every day. So just five short hours ago, Vito posted a story on Mashable about the Lego Golden Girls set that has been submitted to the Lego Ideas submission page. The set includes the foyer, living room, and kitchen of Dorothy Rose and the gang. Vito updated her story just a few hours ago to say that the Golden Girl Lego set had reached the 10,000 supporters it needed to be put in front of the Lego review board. Laura Vito, thank you for being a friend. Have you taken our annual audience survey yet? Go to twit.tv slash survey. Tell us what you think. The survey is anonymous, and we want to know what you think about our shows so we can make them better. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can always write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. You can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.